All right, welcome to Jumpstart, our um, online writing class. We only have uh, three weeks remaining in the semester, including today, and um, we are in the middle of um, a research project. But let's go back and check old work first. All right, we talked last week about sentence openers, and with sentence openers, uh, they are material added to the beginning of a sentence that is not needed to make a sentence a sentence. So in other words, you have a sentence whether you have a sentence opener or not. And the material for that generally was on 104, and we said five aspects of sentence openers. A sentence opener, one, gives a sentence more information. Two, comes at the beginning of a sentence. Three, is often set off with a comma. Four is usually non-essential, uh, meaning that the sentence is a sentence without it. You can cover it up, and from and after the opener, your real sentence starts, and that's a real sentence, even if you take the opener off. And five, it shows advanced writing skills, right? Because to be able to do all the different sentence combining, conciseness techniques, openers, and everything that you've been learning throughout this book is um, a really great... Uh, those are really great skills, and they really show uh, maturity and advancing in writing. So um, then we did just simply prepositional phrase openers on 105. And so prepositional phrase opener, we dissected that whole phrase, and preposition is a word that shows position. A phrase is a group of words that doesn't contain a subject and verb. So a prepositional phrase is a group of words that starts with a preposition and ends with the object. So prepositional phrases from our check sentences include over the clouds, under the clouds, at the clouds, around the clouds. Um, I didn't, I don't think I mentioned this last week, but I do have some products at Character Inc. store that do nothing but teach how to memorize 200 prepositions. And they, they're, it's, a, it's a product called Preposition Practice, I think. And um, so you can check that out if you need more help with that, or if your mom wants you to, you, you or your siblings to work on those. Um, and so prepositional phrase opener would be a prepositional phrase at the beginning of a sentence. All right, so it's added to the beginning of a sentence. The sentence is not a, uh, the, phrase, the opener is not a real sentence. You can't put a period, it can't stand by itself. So you have your opener, then your comma usually, and then your real sentence, right? And we can remove it and it'll still be a sentence. So with the prepositional phrase openers on 106, we said there are three times in which um, we will follow it with a comma, all right? Most openers that are longer, and especially if they are clauses, like subordinate clauses and things, they have commas following them, all right? Prepositional phrase can or cannot uh, based on these three rules. First, on 106, we said that if it's five words or longer, follow it with a comma. You're gonna hear more of a pause the longer the opener is, and it'll be more like a division in your sentence. And number two, if a prepositional phrase is followed by another prepositional phrase, so we call those double PPs, double prepositional phrase openers, and we're gonna follow the whole double with a comma. And if it's short, but it has a date or a name or it's needed for clarity, then you put the comma in for clarity purpose, not necessarily for sentence rhythm. So in that case, in 1492, pause, Columbus sailed the ocean blue, as opposed to in 1492, Columbus. All right, so you can hear how that break is needed. And then for clarity to Tyler, Taylor was the perfect girl. Otherwise, we have Tyler Taylor. All right. So then we have um, the ones that you were supposed to add prepositional phrase openers to, all right? And those were on um, page 106 and 107. The grammar card is on 107 for you to learn more prepositions or to use that list if you needed it. And then plus we had um, another list on 105. So a couple places for you to get your preposition list from. All right, so uh, let me just give you some examples of what might work for these, uh, the first few of these assignments. In the beginning of grammar class, comma, he knew he had a lot to learn about prepositions. 
in the beginning is a prepositional phrase, of grammar class is a prepositional phrase. These are on 108, guys, sorry about that. These are on 108. So we can see that you have two prepositional phrases. In the beginning of grammar class, pause. Then on her practice page, comma, she wrote prepositional phrases. Okay, that would be an optional one because it's four words long as far as the comma is concerned. You can put it in or not. And so with the first one, in the beginning of grammar class, it's a double prepositional phrase, so it's going to have the comma. Put your finger over it and see how you have a real sentence remaining. He knew he had a lot to learn about prepositions. We could put a capital there, and that would be a sentence all by itself, even if you don't have any openers added to it. That is a sentence all by itself. He knew he had a lot to learn about prepositions. So an opener, again, is just tacked on to the beginning of a sentence that's already a real sentence. Same thing is true with number two, cover up on her practice page. That leaves us with, she wrote prepositional phrases. Subject, verb, all make sense, end mark, caves. Capital, all make sense, verb, end mark, subject. And she wrote prepositional phrases is your real sentence, but you just add that opener onto the beginning of it. Uh, number three, the real sentence is she knew that she should put a comma following a lengthy prepositional phrase opener. And we could put anything in front of that that would be a, an opener. Here's a double prepositional, uh, sorry, this is a triple prepositional phrase opener with all of our teacher's lessons behind her. All right, with all is a prepositional phrase, uh, phrase by itself of her teacher's lessons is a prepositional phrase by itself. Behind her is a prepositional phrase by itself. So with all our teacher's lessons behind her, comma, she knew that she should put a comma. Uh, number four, the real sentence is, it wasn't hard for him to learn prepositions. So that could stand all by itself. It's a real sentence. And we can put a triple prepositional phrase again. With his handy preposition list, in front of him. So three prepositional phrases in a row, but notice when you have doubles and triple prepositional phrases for your opener, you don't put commas following each one. You put your comma following the entire opener. So with this handy preposition list in front of him, pause, it wasn't hard for him to learn prepositions. And number five, the sentence there without the opener is she could write interesting sentences. So with a double prepositional phrase opener as of the example, with 100 prepositions in her brain, comma, she could write interesting sentences. All right, so the key, one of the keys to, well, there are a lot of keys. One of the keys to writing well with prepositional phrase openers is that you know a lot of prepositions. The more you know, the more you have at your disposal to choose from to make interesting sentence openers, okay? Another key, is in all uh, openers of all type, knowing what a real sentence is. Like if you don't know he had, knew he had a lot to learn about prepositions, was a real sentence. If you don't know she wrote prepositional phrase is a real sentence, you're gonna have trouble finding where to add your opener. You're gonna have trouble knowing where your comma goes. You're gonna have trouble putting it together because you can't add openers to another uh, phrase. It has to be added to a real sentence. So those are just some examples of the prepositional phrase ones. We'll probably come back and do the subordinator ones here in a little bit. All right, so let's go ahead and um, move on over to more homework that you did. Um, the biographical, 277 is the overview. Remember the overview box is there just to help you see what the entire project contains, right? And we're doing all the assignments within the sheet, within the uh, unit or the week, weekly lesson, but the overview box shows us what um, the whole project contains. So you can always refer back to this in any project, right? To remind yourself, how many quotes do I need? How many paragraphs do I need? And so on. All right, so here on, um, sorry about that, 277, you were supposed to have one quote, six to eight sentences per paragraph, 
three paragraphs for the body. Uh, three things that your person did to promote peace. So we went over last week the outlining, the quotations, and um, right now, the only thing that you had to do on that was if you had not, on 291, if you had not uh, put in your checklist challenge items and sent that to me, you still need to do that, okay? Uh, so when it comes to me, it'll be, it'll be clean in that your uh, mom or your grader may have already edited it, and you will have put in your checklist challenge changes, all right? Okay, so that takes us over to the newest project. Uh, which is now going to become the medium one because we're getting ready to add our final one today. 301, five paragraphs for everybody but Jordan. He's doing six, and that's for the body. Six to eight sentences per paragraph. Everybody's going to do an opening. Everybody's going to do a closing. Everybody's using three sources, merging sources, right? This is going to take you... Um, if you were previously a middle school writer using one source and just getting information as you could, this is going to take you from that to high school writing. When you merge sources together and you say, I need this information from here, I need this information from here, I need this information from here, and you're putting it all together. And everybody had two direct quotes. All right, so the actual assignments were the openings and closings that you added to this. So on 324, let's just talk about the types of openers. So what I would like for you to do, if you uh, want to, if you don't mind, I would like for you to say what your, um, what your paper is about and the type of opener on 324 and the type of closing on 326 that you used. Remember I said another uh, benchmark um, of a mature writer is somebody who can say, I'm doing this specific type of opener to introduce my paper that I already wrote, that I know is strong, I want people to read it, so I'm going to use this type of opener because it will fit with my paper. It will be interesting for people to read. It will be something that people want to read because um, the opener goes well with the body, and it is a, the type of opener that will draw people in to my paper and make them want to read it, right? So we're moving on up in our writing skills all the time. All right, so um, your paper topic, the opening paragraph type, and the closing paragraph type. Does everybody know what I want? 324 and 326, you guys good? All right, we'll pick on Jordan since he had to do six paragraphs. Jordan, let's start with you. Uh, you guys have to mute, unmute yourselves, all right? All righty. Um... My opener, I don't know, I used the quote from, I wrote it here in my paper from a um, scientist that went up north, and my paper's about auroras, or northern lights. And nobody's ever done that, so I was excited about that. <laughs> <laughs> Good. All right, and that quote, um, uh, can, do you have that quote in front of you? Yeah, I do. Can you yeah. read that? I, it was a really good quote. I think your mom yeah. sent it to me about I had a question. Yeah, and the night sky, and the skies of the night were alive with light, with a throbbing, thrilling flame. Amber and rose, violet, opal and gold, it came. It swept the sky like a giant scythe. It quivered back with a wedge, uh, urgently, urgently bright. It cleft the night with a wavy golden edge. Pennants of silver waved and streamed. Lazy banners uh, unfurled. Sudden splendors of sabers gleam, lighting javelins were hurled. There in our awe we crouched and saw with our wild, un uplifted eyes. Charged and, and retired the host of flame in the battlefield of the skies. Very good. All right. One I guess that's more of a poem. But. Yeah, yeah. Um, one of the reasons why I wanted to read that, guys, is because if you remember last week, I talked about how uh, we have a tendency to think that creative elements like alliteration and poetry and um, different kinds of imagery and similes and metaphors and word pictures and things like that, we have a tendency to think that those are for creative writing. And we sometimes can't really see how they would fall or what, what good they would do or what purpose they would serve when we're doing a, um, 
a, a, an informative or a research type of report or even a persuasive essay. And so that's one reason why I wanted him to read that because something like, um, something like his, uh, Something like his, uh, that poem that he's using is full of imagery, right? It's just loaded with imagery. And yet it works super well for a research report. So, um, you know, I just want us to not get locked into, well, these creative elements that we learned early on in the first few chapters about creative writing, I want us to see how those can uh, apply to other things. And especially something, uh, a weather phenomenon that is that um, visual as what his is, really, really uh, benefits from uh, imagery. All right, so let's move on up to Stuart. Stuart, uh, your topic, your opening paragraph type and your closing paragraph type. My opening and my closing paragraph types were um, stories, and then my weather phenomenon was uh, derecho. Okay, what's your phenomenon again? Uh, derecho. Okay, now, uh, so when you say stories, did you bookend? So did you start your story in the first one and end it in the second, or did you do two different? You did that? Yeah. The same story that starts in the opening and then ends in the closing. Good, good. I'm anxious to read that. Okay, let's move over to Adam. Uh, for my opening paragraph, I had statistics, so I did a bunch about, like, hurricanes that have happened, uh, in the past. Oh, good. And for my closing, I did hurricanes from 2010 to 2016. Nice! We didn't even talk about that! I love that! Yeah, breaking your statistics up and having them, that's kind of like a Stewart's book ending, uh, uh, that he is... You know, they're both statistics, but you could just, you could have an opening and a closing with statistics, but by being specific, like he's done, you know, earlier statistics and current statistics, well done. That's very good. All right, Jack. In my opening paragraphs and my topic, I talked about uh, Hurricane Katrina. Okay. And I just spoke about... Like, it's one of the deadliest hurricanes. There was 108 billion in damage. And New Orleans was basically destroyed. Yeah. So did you say use that for your opening and closing? Yeah. Okay. So you had a lot of material. And uh, another reason why that is a really good thing, guys, getting specific like that, like using one particular incident is also a good way to open and close, but it especially is in Jack's case because people know about that. It's modern. And so people, you know, can relate to that. So when you're giving all of these statistics and information about that, people are going, I remember that. Oh yeah, I remember that. And, th and that's very enticing to your reader. So well done, Jack. Uh, Rachel or Rebecca, do you want to, you girls want to go? Nope. Okay. All right. We're going to move on then guys to, um, oh, you did the checklist challenge. Woohoo. All right. 327. 327. You did the checklist challenge and uh, you were supposed to have a grader check your checklist challenge. So now we're going to flip on over and um, get a big sticky if you want. Remember big stickies tell you um, that you need to send me something. All right, or some other way. You could put a paper clip. You could use a different collar. You could um, put your sticky in a different place. Use the same kind of sticky you usually do, but put it in a different place. Whatever helps you the most to be successful, right? That's what it's all about is your success. All right, so I'm going to, we're going to put this on J1, but this won't be your final final. This will be your intermediary final because this is what you're going to send to me. So let's make a note here. 328 J1. I put my little sticky on to show it's an assignment and my big sticky on to show that you're going to send it to me. You guys can do it however you want. All right. So let, but let's make a note under J1. And I'm matching all three. All right. Anybody else matching all three today? Because, you know, that's really cool. All right. If you're not, I won't be mad at you. All right. So here we go. 328, J1, arrow to the bottom, number one. Uh, after grader, check CC. Let's make another note about that, just in case you didn't have your grader, check your CC yet. After grader, 
check CC. And if your parents still need help with that, remember I have a video of it teaching them how to do it. All right. After grader, check CC. Um, insert all CC um, additions. All right, so you're going to take your colorful paper. It's going to be here beside you. You're going to be on your computer, or if you're writing it by hand, you're going to rewrite the whole thing. But if you have it on the computer, you're going to have your CC uh, colorful sheet, not your chart. Your parents, your grader will check your chart. But you're going to have your uh, colorful sheet over here, and you are going to be here, and you're going to be typing in any additions, subtractions, changes, and so forth. All right? Um, make sure another thing that's that kind of gets a little tricky, which if you miss some, don't worry, I'll find it or my assistant. I have editors who also help me at it and then I add it too. So um, I will we'll find it for you if you did this. But it's really important at this stage that you like read some like read that sentence out loud. Does it sound right? Did you need to when you added something? Did you need to change another word? So um, Anyway, just or did you forget to take out the word that you're going to add it to that you're going to change that you're going to change into a different word. So those are the kind of things that you want to look for as you're putting in your CC. So you're going to be sitting here with your colorful here, your computer here, and you're going through and you're just finding your spot, typing in your changes, you know, adding your openers, putting in your commas and all that until you have a clean copy on your computer with all of those changes in it. All right, that's step one. Step two send this clean copy to me in some way that I can print it. Everybody's been doing it correctly now, so that shouldn't be an issue. At first, I didn't know what all I was going to be able to open and print because I'm not familiar with everybody's ways that they, uh, like what kind of documents they have theirs in and stuff. But right now, I'm printing everybody's. Everything's printing fine, so do whatever you've been doing, all right? And send that to me. And then we will edit it and get it back to you. And then you'll make one more final for your, for your mom. All right. Just for mom. Okay. All right. And um, of course you will also study my edits, right? I, I hire somebody to help me edit them. Then I edit them too. I spend a lot of time and money so that you guys can learn from those because it's not just the writing process that you're going to learn from. It's also like, Oh, I see why she put that comma there. Or, oh, she made a note there that that wasn't a complete sentence on the right-hand side, so I don't need my comma. And you're going to learn from those edits. That's going to be a great, great teacher to you. All right? So um, I'm the gift that keeps on giving. Ha! All right. So there you go. After grader, check CC. Insert all CC additions. Two, send this clean copy to me. All right, now we're getting down to where we only have two weeks of class left. So I would like for you to do this in a timely manner because I want to get your final story grade edited too. So uh, do this before next Thursday, okay? Uh, let's, not, let's not put this one off. All right, so then that takes us to our new project. And we are going to move back. Now, actually, you can look at uh, week 14. Week 14 is a cool project. I really like it a lot. It's a dialogue between two toys. But as far as doing, you know, like three or four of each type, whether it's an essay, a research report, um, the kind where I give you material like in Jane Goodall and you write from it, and uh, stories, the basically four types. I mean, the ones that I give you material from can be all any of those other three types, but the four types to be able to do three or four projects of each one of those, um, we're not going to do this one. Uh, this is dialogue, and it's good, and it's important, and this is not an easy project, even though it looks cute and easy and fun, and it is cute and easy and fun, but it's not easy. It's cute and fun. How about that? So we're going to skip week 14, and you can use this with your mom um, uh, next semester if you don't come back, or you can, um, you can do it... Uh, or she can do it with you and your siblings. On page 360 is the sample. It's a really great sample. So you will learn a lot from dialogue if you do use this project. But we are going to move on over to your final project, which is a two-week project, which actually turns out to be a three-week when we're, all of our steps are included, 381. So I'm going to put a sticker at the top so that I know this is my overview box for the whole project. It should say weeks 15 and 16 at the top. Uh, introducing story writing, the very short story 
and it is goal, and then it has a subtitle under there, goals, obstacles, and descriptions of a person or animal trapped in a room. All right, so we're gonna uh, work on a lot of the same story writing elements that we had in your, um, uh, getting away from uh, an animal getting away from something. All right, so let's look at the overview box first and find out what the whole project is going to contain. Uh, it is a short story about leaving a room or getting out of a room. All right, so that is Roman numeral one. Um, trying to find the... All right, uh, Roman numeral two, it's going to be four paragraphs for everybody. So circle that four paragraphs for everyone. Um, each paragraph will be six to eight sentences long. Uh, Roman numeral three, six to eight sentences in each paragraph. You can always have more. You can always have more paragraphs, but not fewer. Okay, no opening, no closing. Remember in story writing, we don't write it and then come back and engage our reader by adding that enticing opening. We weave all the story elements in from the beginning. So it doesn't feel like, you know, a, a time that you might use an, another paragraph to an opening is like um, my assistant and I just published a new book called Twice Told Tales, where you where it's got like a story of Peter Pan or Mowgli or Alice in Wonderland or Mulan. It's got 12 different stories. and it has the twice told, it has the original story, and then it has a spinoff of that. So there are two stories for reading aloud for families or for readers for kids. And um, every story has a little paragraph introduction that tells when the original story was written and stuff like that. But that would be something different. That would not be like adding on a beginning to your story where you say, um, you know, I'm about to tell you a story, da, 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 da. We don't do that in story writing. We're just going to dig right in to the setting and the characters and so forth. All right. Um, you uh, will not have dialogue since it's so short. Um, if you do have dialogue, you'll have, write a longer paper. So, for example, four paragraphs times six. This is going to be 24 to 32 total sentences. And if you were to add dialogue to it, you wouldn't be able to develop your story because you would be spending all of your sentences just talking back and forth. So if you want to include dialogue, you can, but you'll do way more than 32 sentences if you do. Okay, so that's up to you, but you would add way more than 32 sentences to that. All right, we're going to talk about goal setting, obstacles, scene development, um, and uh, outline this week. So go over to 382, please. Um, actually, let's go over to 393 and start with the sample. Let's do that. 393. I need to make a note for my editor, just a sec. Remember how I keep saying this book is going out? Well, I just gave her the final edits yesterday. Um, but um, I just found another edit, so she's going to be ready to crown me. It really is going to go out. You guys are going to be the last test group before it's published. Um, all right, so here we go, 393. Something startled Jim awake. He blinked his eyes several times, trying to figure out what it was. This was one of many times a day he wished he could just stand up and look around. But since the accident, the only movement he had was one finger on his right hand. With a few clicks of his controller, he called up the house's electrical equipment. The screen showed that the phones were not working. Then he smelled it. Smoke. All right, non-homework color, guys. So get, your, get another color out. On 393, paragraph one, scene one, woke up, started computer, equals introduced his limitations and the setting. Okay, there's no, this is a story about, I'm telling you a story about somebody who couldn't move. Uh, this is story is about getting out of a room, nothing like that. It's all just woven into that first paragraph. 
So we're going to call this paragraph one and scene one, because for the very short story, we're going to say a scene is anytime you change locations or actions. All right. Um, in, in movies and longer things like that, a scene could have like a couple of locations or actions in it. But for the very short story, a paragraph or scene is, um, is a place or an action. All right. So this is, Introducing his limitations and setting. Paragraph two. Jim was fully awake now and could tell that it was an electrical fire, probably the reason his phone lines were down. With three more clicks, he activated the battery powered emergency function to contact 911. Because it operated on batteries and was separate from the phone lines, he was able to get the message out, although it would take at least 15 minutes for them to arrive. The smoke was getting stronger now. The fire was spreading quickly. Although he couldn't yet see the flames, he could hear them getting larger. Using the computer system, Jim opened the automated windows and blinds, letting the outside light in. The smell of smoke then mixed with another smell, gas. It was only a matter of time until the entire home would explode. Okay, non-homework color. Paragraph two, scene two. Contacted fire department with clicks, see smoke, slash hear fire, slash smell smoke. Another edit. All right. Oh, I drove myself crazy. All right. So, guys, this is scene two, and a new action is taking place. In the first action, he woke up, he started his computer and you found out about him. In the second scene, um, he used his clicks to contact the fire department, and he sees smoke, hears smoke, and smells smoke. Or hears fire and smells smoke. All right, paragraph three. Help, help, he cried out, but no one responded. No one outside responded. Jim cranked the speakers up as high as they would go and instructed the computer to cry out for him. It was louder, but still, could, did, not, still did not bring help. The smoke was overpowering now, and Jim began to feel lightheaded. He could see a couple of people milling about outside his house, watching the smoke, but they could not see in to know he was inside. All right, and this is paragraph three, scene three. The volume is up, he sees people, and the smoke is strong. And finally, paragraph four starts with finally. Finally, he had an idea. His mind was foggy, and the clicks were not as quick but he deliberately put the front blinds down and began to open and close them with his fingers tapping wildly. Jim's original idea had been to sign SOS, but by, the time his mind, but by that time his mind was in such a fog that he couldn't remember how. Slowly the smoke overcame him and he began to drift away. The last thing he remembered before passing out was the crashing sound of a door being smashed in and two sets of hands lifting him from the bed. Someone had gotten the message. All right, that's paragraph four slash scene four. He tried to click SOS, smoke overcame him. He overcame the obstacle and met the goal. All right, those are the things we're gonna work on now. The goal, the obstacles, and the action and the setting. So page 382, lesson A says goal setting. The protagonist must have a goal. The protagonist is the main character of the story. He or she is sometimes called the star. The character may be a human, an animal, or even an object. But the important thing is that most of the action centers around the protagonist. The protagonist of a story has at least one goal. This is the goal that the entire story revolves around. A character may, and usually will, in longer stories, have smaller goals and secondary goals, otherwise known as subplots but a character must have a singular goal that holds the entire story together. Without this goal, the story is just a description of events. All right, so that's next he did this, then somebody came, then he did this, then that happened. That's not a story because you are just giving a description of events. We are going to do a goal, the obstacles and everything so that you have a story that goes through to this final solution either solving it or else failing at solving it. In your story, the goal will be simple, get out of the room or get out of whatever. Keep in mind that 
um, the shorter the story that you're writing, the less, the fewer places you can have in your story, right? Because otherwise you just end up writing an essay. For example, if you decided that you wanted to write a four paragraph story and instead of getting out of a room, you wanted the person to, um, uh, have one uh, have it be and instead of just happening at one one point in time you wanted to have your person over a week get away from a kidnapper and so you had four paragraphs to do this and so this ha these had things happen on this day these things happen on this day these things happen on this day that wouldn't be a story because you would have four paragraphs of just saying well on the first day this happened and then he did this and then he did that and still in the same paragraph, because you only have four paragraphs, on the second day, he did this and this, and the kidnapper did this. Next paragraph. On the third day, this happened, and he was served this for breakfast, and he saw uh, a crack in the window, and he thought about this kidnapper schedule. On day four, he started making the crack bigger underneath the blinds, and so on. Next paragraph. On day five, uh, the kidnapper went to the store, and so he had a lot of time to work on making the crack larger, and um, he thought he was going to starve to death. And then the last paragraph, on day six, the kidnapper fell asleep in front of the TV, the crack was big enough, and he got out. What you did there, because you only had four paragraphs to do it, is you just gave a, tell, a retelling. You just listed a series of events. Right, four paragraphs is not big enough, not long enough to tell a story that happens over a week. It's not enough space to tell a story that has multiple days and that has multiple actions and many actions and actually subplots, right? So you have the sub, you know, you have all of these other things going on, but you only have 24 to 32 sentences to say it. Over a week's time, all that would be is this happened, then this happened, then he did this, then that happened. The next paragraph, it was a new day, this happened, he did this, he thought about this, the kidnapper did this, next paragraph. That's not a story. That is a retelling of events, all right? So that has a place, but that's not short story writing. And so you want to keep your period of time, number of actions, number of scenes, number of obstacles, number of sub goals and subplots. You want to keep that correlating with the amount of space that you have for your story. And so with that, we, we, in our books, we make the story assignment match the number of paragraphs that you're assigned. And so you'll see in here, you're not going to have a whole week or two to do it. You're not gonna have multiple kidnappers and people coming and going and all that because you would not be writing a story then. All right, so where are we? Two goals. Two goals might even contradict. For example, if doing the right thing causes you to lose a friend, your goals may clash. The important thing at this point is that you are clear at the beginning of your story writing that the main character's goal, what the main character's goal is, keeping a friend at all costs, not recommended, or doing the right thing, even if it means losing a friend. All right, so we are going to work on this through Bible stories. We usually use something that students are familiar with, and most kids uh, in our classes anyway are familiar with Bible stories. And so uh, we're gonna do 382A. And if you have a big sticky note, a medium sticky note, put it over the sample answers. We have help boxes there, but sometimes it wouldn't be cheating to use the help boxes because they're help boxes, right? But that won't help you if you if you just look down there. And also, if you accidentally see it, then you won't be able to think of your own. That happens to me. I don't want to know the answer. You know how, um, you know, in a crossword puzzle, you don't want to glance at something and see part of the answer because then you'll just put that answer in when it's time and you won't you won't try to think of it. It ruins it for you. All right, so don't ruin it for you, right? <laughs> Gonna ruin schoolwork by looking at the answers. Um, it's not as much fun, right? All right, so we have Bible characters, Bible stories, and we're going to determine the character's goals in that particular instance. All right, and this will help you develop your goals when you're doing your story uh, next week. All right, so here we have Gideon, Joshua, Moses, Wiseman, Nehemiah, Noah, and Daniel when he's in the lion's den. 
All right, so for example, David had one goal, one primary goal at the time in this particular story, and that was to defeat Goliath. All right, so you're going to look up these Bible characters if you don't already know them and determine in the particular story that you're looking at what their goal was in that story. All right, that's if you don't have a goal, you don't have a story, right? You have a, a retelling of events and it may or may not be interesting. 383, lesson B, obstacles. The protagonist must face ob obstacles, all right? Even the best goal means nothing in a story unless there are significant obstacles in the way of the main character reaching his goals. The character must have the inner strength to fight through whatever obstacles are in his way. If in your story the character wants to get out of the room, but all he has to do to achieve that goal is go to the door, turn the knob, and walk through, it will obviously not be an interesting story. So your character has a goal and big obstacles standing in his or her way. What does he or she do? This is where stories get very interesting. If your character sees all the obstacles and decides to give up on the goal, the story ends there. But if your character faces the obstacles, he or she may succeed and achieve the goal or may fail and not achieve the goal. However, either way, the obstacle, the character meeting those obstacles creates what every story needs and that's the drama. All right, so we are looking at the obstacles that are gonna keep your character from achieving the goal, right? Um, there are a lot of Christmas movies out right now, and I don't know if your family is a Christmas movie family, but tomorrow night we have our traditional white Christmas night where we eat shrimp alfredo, white spaghetti. One of the only times the kids ever got shrimp when they were growing up was on white Christmas night. And, uh, and then, we watch the movie White Christmas. So we're really into Christmas movies. Um, but we're, I'm really picky about my Christmas movies, right? And especially the, the longer I've gone in writing, like when I first started writing books, I knew a lot about how to teach research and how to teach essays, but I didn't know a lot about how to teach story writing. I wasn't a story writer until my son and I wrote our novel several years ago together. Um, but uh, Joshua taught me a lot about how to teach story writing and he wrote these lessons and then that taught me more right but through that process I started getting really picky about movies I mean just like and books and stuff like that like I just couldn't read anything lame you know it was just it was just boring I just couldn't and so Christmas movies because people like a lot of Christmas movies they like throw at you at Christmas season you know dozens and dozens and dozens of movies you know and you could go on these uh, different channels and they have nothing but Christmas movies and so forth. But you have to wonder when they make so many Christmas movies over and over and over and over again, um, just how quality the storyline is, right? <laughs> and a lot of times maybe you're like me that you get started in one of those Christmas movies and you're like, this is so lame. Like it took nothing to meet that final goal. Those obstacles were just stupid. They weren't even engaging. Nobody, or you watch something and you're like, I could care less about this character because part of being engaged in a movie or a book or a story is that you care. Like even this little short story, I really cared about that guy who was in that wheelchair. I mean, right off the bat, I cared about him, you know, but you watch a Christmas movie and you're like, I could care less. And then you're like, like those characters are the same as the last movie I watched. They're all the same. It's just so, it's just so cliched right and so you can see how all of this comes together so when you watch a movie and this is a good time because a lot of people watch a lot of Christmas movies when you watch a movie ask yourself you know do I see the protagonist's goal do I see the obstacles are the obstacles legit are they just thrown in there because you know they need 90 minutes to fill you know do you care about the character do you, don't even talk to me about the acting and the directing. Oh my word. It's like, oh, the cheaper the movie, you know. I know that they, the movie companies don't all have a lot of money to make, make, you know, big blockbuster movies, but you want to care about the characters. You want to care about the end result. You want to cheer for the person to, to get to the final goal. You want to, you know, be on the edge of your seat, seeing if he overcomes the obstacles. And when you're watching a movie and you feel let down from a movie, or you think it's really lame, ask yourself some of those things I just said. Do I, did I care about the character? 
Or was the character cliched? Was he just like all the other characters all the time? Does this feel like the movie I just watched last week again? Did the obstacle, were the obstacles not significant enough? Did the final goal not intrigue me? Did I not really think it was that great of a goal so it didn't matter if he met it? Ask yourself why you don't like a movie. Because when you don't like a movie, you know, special effects aside and all that, when you don't like a movie, it's often because the story is flawed. Somewhere in here, something is missing or something is not really done well throughout the story writing process. So um, uh, movies are a really good way to learn about story writing. Yeah, so now you have to go, go off of here and tell your parents, she said I have to watch a lot of movies to learn about story writing. I'm sorry, mom, but you know, that's my school today, right? Okay, all right, so we're gonna do 383B. And we are going to find the obstacles facing the characters that you just studied in A. Okay, so I'm gonna put a big sticky over your help box again at the bottom of 383. And you can look after you find yours, definitely look and compare yours and see, oh, okay, I can see why that would be the obstacle. We'll talk about it again next week as well. All right, so you wanna know what uh, obstacles uh, were standing in the way of each of these characters for the goal that you put. So whatever goal you put on 382, what obstacles were standing in each of those characters' way on 383? Okay, so the obstacle will match, the goals will match the obstacles. It'll be the same story. All right, so for example, in the case of David, he wanted to defeat Goliath on 382. On 383, uh, his obstacles were that Goliath was huge, David was small, David had no weapons, and David had no training. All right, so do you see how you discover the obstacles that are standing in the way? All right, so let's at least put, let's make a note, uh, circle three, to at least put three obstacles for each character. Okay, so just circle three there in the assignment B. All right, let's see how much time we have. Oh, we're doing great, good. All right, so on 384, we're gonna talk again about scene descriptions. We had this when your uh, person was getting away, when your animal was getting away from another animal, yeah. We had this in your earlier story when an animal was getting away from another animal, um, and we're going to apply it again today in this uh, assignment. So again, two gutters, lack of description and over description. We are on 384. This is when we first started learning our BHL verbs, if I remember right. Descriptive writing is like bowling in that there are two gutters. The first gutter is the lack of description. This type of writing projects no pictures into the imagination of the reader. The second gutter is over description. This is when every aspect of the scene is described in too much detail. When this happens, the whole scene grinds to a stop while an entire paragraph is spent describing a chair, for example. All right, so we have two keys. Let's use your non-homework color for this again. One, use action. Circle that and write it one beside it. Two, be picky. Circle that and put a two beside it. So these are two keys to uh, this whole problem of solving the problem of description. The first key is to avoid either of these pitfalls using action as much as possible. For example, instead of writing the spindly antique chair sat in the corner, write the antique chair wobbled precariously as the man sat down. By doing this, you keep the scene moving while describing the things in the scene. You can be assured of having more action-driven descriptions if you use action verbs, right? Remember, we talked about how you need to know BHL verbs, 36 of them from the BHL verb song, um, but that you can't um, use them by themselves. You need to use them with an action. So that is going to give your sentences action generation. So they're going to be action-driven sentences instead of being um, uh, passive. All right, so for example, instead of using the window pane was glossy, see that example in the middle 384, say the window pane glistened in the rain. All right, that tells you that it was glossy without just saying was glossy was is a BHL verb, we don't want to use that by itself. We could say was glistening, you can use it with an action, but you don't want to use BHL verbs by themselves. All right, so if you do not know your BHL verbs, let's mark this for homework, C1. Hopefully you learned a lot of them, and I think I gave you a document with them too. Um, oh, I guess it's here. I guess it's listed. 
Okay, so this is to the tune of the ABC or Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. So you can sing them if that helps you. Uh, whatever helps you the most, right, to be successful. Okay, second key um, up at the top at 385. The second key is to be picky about what you spend time describing and what you do not. The point of description fictional writing is to put images into the mind of the reader and put emotions into his or her heart. Some things need to be described in more detail than others. So let's uh, mark the assignment and then we'll talk about it. This assignment is C2. So C1 is your VHL verb assignment. C2 is your uh, sentences. All right, what we're going to do here is we are going to take a sentence that's given to us that has a BHL verb, passive, act, passive verb in it, uh, and we're going to make it an action-generated sentence. So the example is the sinister man's eyes were hollow. All right, so with your non-homework color, highlight were. That's the BHL verb that you want to get rid of. All right, you don't want that verb, that BHL verb in there unless it's with an action word. And we're going to change our sentence to say, instead of the sinister man's eyes were hollow, we're going to change it to the sinister man peered through hollow eyes. Okay, so he's doing something. We're still finding out that his eyes were hollow, but it's not just they were hollow. He's doing something. And as he does it, we find out that he had hollow eyes. All right. And so you're going to do the same thing. Now, I'm going to give you a little uh, cheat sheet here um, because that's the kind of girl I am. So uh, I didn't have you on 385. Put your arrow. So do that first. Put your arrow at the bottom of 385. So C2, sticky note, arrow at the bottom. And um, there's a help box on 386 also. All right. So let's go through with your non homework collar and highlight the verbs that you want to get rid of. All right, we're going to get rid of the BHL verbs in these sentences. So number one, the fall had the wall, the fall, fall had wall. The wall had filthy rancid water on it. We're going to get rid of had. That's a BHL verb. Okay, it's passive. It's just that it's there. It's not that you're doing anything. Okay, number two, the little impoverished boy sat in debtor's prison. Okay, sat is not a BHL verb, but it's not active either. And we know he's in debtor's prison and he's not moving a lot, but can we do something else that's, that's more active than that? Uh, the example is the, uh, for the help box, the debtor's prison seized the little impoverished boy. So he's in there, he's not moving or anything, but if we still have a better verb, um, the debtor's prison seized him. Number three, sat. The meagless, meager, tasteless stew sat on the tray. Number four, the robe had lots of collars. Had. We don't want to get rid of that BHL verb. Number five, there was a lot of wind in the storm. Was. We want to get rid of that BHL verb. Number six, Jim was woken up by a sound. Was. We want to get rid of that BHL verb. I'm at the top of 386 now. Number seven, the smoke was in the room. Was. Another BHL, these are all, uh, the rest of these are all, the verb was, BHL. No one was there, the smoke was everywhere, there was someone in the doorway. All right, on page 387, you are going to choose five objects in the room you're sitting in right now and use action verbs to describe each object. Five sentences, C3, let's highlight it, put on your sticky note. There, uh, with your non-homework collar, you can circle this sample box at the bottom to help you out if you get stuck at the bottom of 387. Okay, C3, choose five objects in the room you're sitting in right now. Write a sentence using action describing each one. So, uh, he slammed his shoulder into the thick wooden door, but it didn't budge. He rotated the water glass rhythmically, watching the tiny impurities. So, you're uh, the door, you're talking about the door. On number two, you're talking about the, uh, the glass. Number three, her long fingernails clacked intensely against the keyboard. You're talking about the keyboard or her fingernails. All right, using action. Go ahead with your non-homework collar and highlight slammed, rotated, clacked. Okay, look how those are action, verb rather, action verbs rather than BHL verbs. All right, so by now you are ready to outline your story. Um, so let's go on over to the outlining space provided in lesson in 15 and 16. 
on page 392. It says, now you're ready to outline your story. Your story will be three or four, everybody circle four, we're all doing four, um, six to eight sentences, 24 to 32 total sentences, six to eight sentences per paragraph. Okay, that's back in your overview box, but uh, just circle four. Your story will be four paragraphs in length. You will simply write a very short story about a person or animal who is in a room and wants to get out. He or she will face obstacles and will either overcome these and succeed, get out, or not overcome them and fail, not get out. So we have our sample here. So let's mark E1 and draw an arrow to the sample in case you need any inspiration. We already read it together and talked about the scene breakdown, but go ahead and mark that for homework and put an optional beside it in case you want to reread it, all right? That might help you when you are trying to think of your um, obstacles. All right, and then E2, what is the goal of your character? Okay, just you can fill that in right now, or you don't have to fill it in now, but think about uh, getting out of one place, one moment in time, one spot. Don't have him getting out of a lot of places and don't have it happening over a period of time. Uh, otherwise, you'll start to write an essay instead of a story. E3, what will the setting of your story be? Where is it going to take place? E4, list three obstacles your character will face. All right, we have some help boxes there also. So on 392, possible story ideas include a flooded basement, maybe from an animal's point of view, a person trapped beneath something in a room, a person trapped in a wrecked car or airplane, a pet locked in a pet carrier, a person in a wheelchair not able to climb stairs, those are just some ideas. You can use any number of things that would be one person in one situation at one moment with in one place and one moment in time. All right, and then obstacles, for example, from the, sam the sample story that we read on 393, the obstacles are the locked door, no windows, the fire in the basement, and of course his uh, inability to, oh no, that isn't, those aren't right. The obstacles from this story were um, his uh, disability, his inability to communicate, uh, him not being able to climb upstairs, and uh, nobody knowing that he was in there. So, let me fix that. All right, so yours can be, you know, based on an animal maybe that can't swim, or it could be, you know, a, a small child maybe a, a, a toddler who can't walk or can't communicate, uh, being stuck someplace, uh, an adult who can't get out because of a disability or that he's trapped under something, right? Maybe something is holding him down and he's unable to get out. Um, any of those, but anything you want. All right, so let's go on over to the actual outline. So um, let me think what you have this week. You have your uh, weather phenomenon that you're going to send me. You have your uh, op goal, obstacles, and so forth um, creation uh, from the Bible characters, um, action sentences, and pre-writing right here on 392, and then your outline. We won't write this week, okay? So your outline will be on 394, E5. All right, so now that you've done 392, now that you've done 392, you will know what you want in each paragraph, right? You'll know what the obstacles are going to be, the setting and all that. So outlining will be pretty fast. Once you outline, the writing will be super fast. Now, this is a point where the outlining is more important than ever. You know, I talk about getting away from your source. I talk about being able to use your outline by itself without looking at, back at anything else and so on and so forth. But in story writing, the beauty of having a thorough, great, extensive outline is that it frees your brain because we only have so much brain power, even though I like to think we have more and I want more and I like to think I have more. But it frees your brain because you don't have to think about all of the backstory. You don't have to think about your um, scenes, your character, 
your obstacles, your goal, what's going to happen in your story. So it frees all of your brain from doing that to writing really, really well because all that is already laid out for you in your outline. And so story writing is actually, people think that story writing is a time you don't need an outline as much, but it's actually just the opposite. Because if your outline is so thorough, you can just sit here and start typing and your brain can just use all of its creative powers because you're not having to do so many different skills at one time. And you and your, your imagery, your uh, word choices, your action generated sentences with verbs with action verbs rather than passive verbs your description all of that is so much better because your brain is not having to do so many things all at the same time and instead you can focus on the creative aspects of it and not the more technical aspects of, um, of outlining and um, laying out what you want all to happen in your story so here we go on the outline on 394 you're going to use these notes and one of the most note taking this note taking space and with your non home color I need for you to, to star heart sunshine flowers rainbows and unicorns topic of paragraph a topic of paragraph B topic of paragraph C we need arrows at the bottom too, guys arrow at the bottom of 394 arrow at the bottom of 395 everybody's doing four paragraphs uh, 396 topic of paragraph D all right, these are your scenes. So let's write that in instead. Let's write in topic of paragraph A, scene one. Okay, I'm just uh, right beside that line, I'm putting topic of paragraph A slash scene one colon. Okay, and this will actually be in the final. So see, I'm glad we did this with you because um, got one more little fix here for my editor. All right, so topic of paragraph B, scene two. Topic of paragraph C, scene three. Topic of paragraph D, scene four. Okay, mark through the word extension there because everybody's gonna do this, not just Jordan. All right, everybody's gonna do four total. All right, so these are, the reason I said, you know, the hearts, flowers, sunshine, rainbows, and unicorns is because you need that line filled in right off the bat. Okay, you are going to have what's happening in each scene. This is going to make your story flow so well. It's going to be like, this is happening in this paragraph. Oh, I'm changing paragraphs, so I'm gonna change scenes. So you can see like in the sample how that was done. Let's look at that again on page. Oh, where is that sample? Oh, it's right in the one page back. On 393, you can see how that is. Let's just, um, let's make a note. Draw an arrow from where you wrote scene one to the bottom with your non-homework color and write C scenes in sample, page 393. I mean, I did it with you in class, but I want you to look at it again, all right? So from your scene where you wrote scene one on 394, draw an arrow to the margin just like this, okay, and write C scenes, it can be anywhere, but I just put mine down there where I have some space, C scenes and sample, page 393. All right, the sample has the scenes all delineated for you. In parentheses, bold font, we highlighted them already, so you'll be able to find them easily, okay? Scene one, woke up, started the computer, introduced his limitations and settings. Notice they, he, they did not say, you know, Jim was, uh, a paraplegic. Jim could not stand. Jim could not walk. Jim had a wheelchair and a computer. Jim used the wheelchair, the computer to communicate with people. It doesn't say that. Look at how well done this is in this opening. It introduces all of those concepts to you without being boring, without saying, Jim was in an accident. Jim didn't walk. Jim was a paraplegic. Jim was in a wheelchair. Jim had to communicate with the computer. Jim had to click. It doesn't say all that. Isn't that so cool? This is what makes stories intriguing and interesting to people. The next one, scene two, contacted fire department with clicks. See smoke, hear fire, smell smoke. Scene three, volume up, see people, smoke strong. Scene four, um, 
smoke overcame him. He tried to click SOS, smoke overcame him, and then um, being rescued. All right, super short story, but super well done. It packs so much in it. I can say this because I didn't write this sample, okay? <laughs> All right, so back over here to 394. The most important thing to start with is your topic of paragraph slash scene. All right, so we're gonna make sure you have all of your scenes. Whatever you're saying happens in that scene is what you're going to put throughout it. So whatever obstacles, whatever introducing of anything, you'll put throughout it in your sentence lines as uh, these sentence lines of your story. All right, so once you have the topic of paragraph lines filled in, then you'll do your sentence by sentence or your key points, whatever you want it to do. The goal has got to be that you can sit down and write from this outline without having to think about what you wanted to happen, but instead using all your creative powers during the writing process. Um, you can add, subtract, or divide however you desire. So you, if you want to add a couple more paragraphs, you can do that. Right, and you can have more things happen. You could have more obstacles, or you could have maybe the uh, the escape be a little bit longer than just the sentence that was in our story. But in order to do that, you would have to add more paragraphs. All right, and you may or may not use all the sentence lines. We had six to eight sentences minimum per paragraph, so you can use up to ten. Generally speaking, when you get into 11, 12, 13 sentences, especially if your sentences are packed with information. When you get into 11, 12, 13 sentences, then you have to ask yourself, should this be like rescue part one, rescue part two? Do I really have kind of two scenes here going on? Um, them coming in and then them taking him out? Okay, and then that would be where you want to break up your paragraph into two instead. Okay, but the outlining space is for you, so you can tweak it however you want. All right, whatever you want to make it ha to make happen there. Next week, we will write the rough draft um, uh, of this story. And if you have any questions, text me, email me, message me, call me, uh, get a hold of me, and I can answer your questions for you, all right? Is everybody good? We made it. My other students are out there, but I made it in time. So anybody else have any questions? Everybody know what you're doing? Okay, don't hesitate to contact me if you need help, all right? All right, thank you for your great cooperation. See ya.